I'm Nick Harcourt for AKG's Stories Behind the Sessions with Gary Beers. Gary is a musician and producer and was the bass guitarist for the band In Excess. He joins us on this episode to talk about the band's most successful studio album, Kick, which just celebrated its 35th anniversary. The album has been certified six times platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America and peaked at number three on the Billboard 200. It also spawned four top 10 US singles, New Sensation, Never Tear Us Apart, Devil Inside, and Need You Tonight. Gary, welcome. G'day, Nick. Thanks for having me. So good to meet you. You know, before we get into Kick, which was recorded in 1987, maybe you could give us a little bit of a background on the decade before that, as the band built a career with relentless touring and your first five albums that came before Kick. Uh, maybe we could start with the first album, self-titled, released in 1980. Can you share that experience? You guys were what, 20, 21? Yeah, we were, we were pretty young. We were signed to a very small, somewhat independent label called Deluxe Records. Not much money to be had, so mm -hmm. the sessions mainly involved going in the studio after gigs, sometimes two or three gigs a night, then going in the studio until dawn, repairing whatever gear we had to try and get through the session, and then uh, walking out in the daylight, right. kind of learning, learning as we go, because it was the first time we were in a proper studio. How did that experience shift, shift as you worked your way through the next couple of albums? How did things change in writing and in the studio work? Well, we just kind of, yeah, we kind of learnt as we went. The first album was a bit of a hodgepodge of songwriters. Um, Andrew hadn't quite, you know, t developed into the songwriter he is today or you know, later in our career. Um, so we're all kind of putting our hands up and throwing things around. It was like old school, you know, just this riff, that part, you know, right. throw it all together in a room. And by the time you get around to kick, you must have felt like you were on a rocket ship. Yeah, we'd, we'd had a very successful tour. You know, Listen Like Thieves did very well and really opened some doors in England and, and Europe. And we had a couple of songs that we'd written ready to go in the studio. And so we played them live and we realised that, you know, they weren't good enough. So we actually ended up going in the studio. By that time, Chris Thomas is like, well, can we just do the what you need exper ex experiment and make a whole album like that? Right. And so we said, okay. And we were, we were all big enough to say, yep, that really worked. So Andrew and Michael are gonna write the whole album and we're all gonna put out, you know, play it live and put it, in the, you know, put it down in the studio as live as we can. It'll still be a band, a band album, but it'll be, it'll be written by the, the two best writers in the band. So let's get into the process then of making that record, the story, story behind the sessions. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you made the majority of the album in a studio in Sydney called Rhinoceros, mm -hmm. very famous studio. Mm -hmm. From when I lived in Australia, I was mm -hmm. very aware of that studio. Made some great records there, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Rhino was a magic studio. Yeah. Take us, take us through the process. I mean, were the songs ready when you hit the studio or did you write in the studio? There was a lot of, of writing in the studio. Andrew's demos, um, they, they sound like what the end product will lean towards, but he leaves, he you know, purposely leaves them pretty empty. The extreme is Need You Tonight, which he had is pretty much exactly how he recorded on his demo, is what you hear. Plus us overdubbing me a fuzz bass, John the, you know, some overdub drums, uh, Kirk doing all his fantastic sort of, you know, noodly guitar. Um, but it's basically his demo because it was just so good. Why try and rec recreate it? And by then, he, his home studio stuff was, you know, technology had moved ahead and he, and he, he, he had some pretty, pretty good stuff at home. Right. Can you give us an example of any of the other songs that are on the album that perhaps came together a little bit differently? Yeah, the, the title track, Kick. I mean, um, again, Chris, Chris Thomas said, like, um, I'm not hearing enough songs, not hearing all the hits. So he sent Andrew and Michael off, I think they went to New Zealand and wrote, um, to get away from everything and wrote Kick, uh, I think Calling All Nations and Need You Tonight. And, and yeah, and Kick was a very basic thing um, based around a, the chord progression and a Motown bass line, which was always my bread and butter. I mean, yeah. I grew up on, on James Jameson and then you know, uh, John Paul Jones from Zeppelin and his Motown influence. That's, that's my bread and butter of where I learned bass. Right. So, yeah. You know, my bass lines probably influenced him to put that kind of style of bass on his demo, and then I just took it and ran with it on the, on the song. So, and that, that song in particular grew in the studio. So did you record live? Did you multi-track? Was it a, a mix? Um, we always had the multi-tracks going. We actually always had two multi-tracks going. Um, and, but we tried to get it as live as possible. I mean, um, yeah, as I said, songs like Need You Tonight just built 
um, songs like Listen Like Thieves um, from the previous record had taught us that you know, getting it as a band, sometimes you know, everyone gets a part that they might not have gotten if they were sitting doing an overdub and everyone's picking apart their, you know, what, they've, what they're doing as opposed to just getting it you know, with, the, with the drum track. I mean, that's right. what I, I got pretty much most of the bass lines that are recorded on kick with a drum track because I, I really don't like doing overdubs. So the majority of that, that album was done in Sydney, but there were bits and pieces done in other places as well, right? Yeah, well, all the main recording was done in Rhinoceros and upstairs, the original studio in Rhinoceros was where we did pretty much all of it. And then uh, Michael, by then, you know, because this is our second album with Chris Thomas, he'd already convinced Chris Thomas that he does his best vocals in Paris. <laughs> Yeah, with, with no one, with Me no one else around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tried that. Like, can I do the bass in like, you know, I'm Fiji much, or I'm you much know, better with, in take Fiji. my surfboard? Yeah. It's like, nah. So um, yeah, he that was that became a thing, which is, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, obviously got the best results out of Michael was, sure. was doing what he what he did, and and a lot of his mates, you know, like Bono and all those in the Duran Duran guys. A lot of his mates, you know, lived in lived in Europe. So, and it was mixed in in New York, um, and mastered in New York. So it, you know. But the you know, majority of, the, of the, 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 the track recording was at Rhinoceros. How important was it to have the continuity of working with Chris again? It was brilliant. I mean, as I said, because you know, Listen Like Thieves has some really amazing moments. You know, to me, it, it's, it, sonically, I think it sounds incredible. Um, we used a guy called Steve Churchyard, an English engineer, and I think the guitar sounds especially and drum sounds on that. On that album are fantastic. They they really they're quite different to kick, to my to, to my ears anyway. How much involvement did the record label have? I read somewhere that they weren't really mm. happy with what you'd made and wanted you to do more. Is that right? Well, that's the beauty of doing things in Australia. Is the record label you know were signed out of America, um, and they didn't come out. I mean, you know, <laughs> There's all. nobody flying to Australia to no, and, sit and, in the studio. No, and we we're not really open to having record companies sit around anyway. I mean, sure. we. we you know, we we try to do our own thing, and and our manager, in his in his wisdom, had had a sign to different territories with different labels. So with you know, Poly Phonogram in, in Europe, and and you know, Atco slash Atlantic in, in America, and um, and that was great because you got the best out of whatever label, That's as opposed to being just smart. part of a stable yeah. of 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 acts all around the world. So I mean, Chris Murphy was a, was a visionary, and and one of the first people to do that. So uh, that was his job and he, he did it great. So we didn't really hear from the record label. We knew th that they wanted more what you needs. Um, but of course, when Chris flew, you know, flew to America to play the, you know, the boss of, of Atlantic, um, the masters, he, he said, don't, hit, don't hear any hits. Yeah, give, and it's true, give you a million bucks to go off and re-record the whole album. Rewrite and re-record the whole Boy, album. Boy, was he wrong. Yeah. So Chris just basically went around his back, you know, behind him, and, and um, spoke to the Atlantic's radio department, and they loved what they heard. He didn't tell, you know, the boss that that's what he was doing, and then we just did our usual thing. We we just went out and and toured our asses off playing college college towns in America, and building it up on college radio. And then by the time that you know the boss of Atlantic um, sort of you know, knew what we were doing, it was already you know barreling up the charts on the college and then crossing over to mainstream to top 40. So he had to you know, pull his head in and, and jump on board and th throw some money. But we'd, we put all, all our own money in it. You've got a couple of things keeping you busy these days, including these beautiful bass guitars next to us, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. But you've also got another band, Ash and Moon. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, the band that you're working with right now. I've been looking for people to write with. Uh, I wrote some songs on, on the, the, the last In Excess album, Switch. I guess I just hadn't found the right person to write with until I, I um, met Toby Rand. Uh, he's from Melbourne, he's a fellow Australian living here. We had the album ready to go, we'd signed a distribution deal, and then COVID hit, all tours cancelled, mm -hmm. record label just basically folded. So we just kind of um, shelved it. And so we, we released, I think, four or five songs. We did videos during COVID, which was interesting. So we did a, a video downtown LA with no one. With you know, with it, we just took a drone and drove around the streets and yeah. and played on a rooftop just like like the Beatles, you know, like and and no one like a, a video that probably would have cost ten million dollars in 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 you know to to clear the streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cost us you know hundred bucks. Nobody like, out. It cost us the gas. 
Um, so yeah, so we've been just pretty active in writing and, and, um, and we're just getting back into that uh, 2023. We want to really re restart the band as far as you know, live performance um, and getting the, you know, the album out and the new material that we've been writing out there. The material you've recorded so far is out and it's on all the streaming services as well. Yeah, it is. It's, it's out, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's out um, on Spotify and it's out on, on iTunes. There are, I think, f five songs we released and then we did uh, acoustic versions during lockdown, um, you know, zooming each other, um, <laughs> yeah, as, as, as you do. Got to um, do something, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we, we released those as well you know, and with videos. So they're all, they're all available, but it's, you know, there's ashenmoon.com if you want to, or one word, Ash and Moon, if you want to um, go there and see the videos and what have you. Because we do our own videos. It's, it's, we rehearsed in my garage. You know, it, it's, it's really old school, That's, and I love that. Let's talk about these beautiful guitars that are sitting right next to us. Yeah, these are my GGB basses, the Gary Gary Beers basses. I, I've been, I did electronics from, um, I did woodwork at high school as an elective and I did two years of electronics after school, but I, I kind of failed that and by then I was already in, in a band with Andrew and Michael, so that took over. Um, but I already started the idea of design of, of a pickup. So this is the pickup. It's a and there's two different versions of it there. It's a, it's a quad coil, so it's four coils in there. So one pickup with no batteries and just these controls, you can get five distinct vintage bass sounds. Mm -hmm. So you can get like the, the, the old P bass, which is the basis of it, because the, my NXS bass is a 58 Fender bass that I, I call Old Faithful. And that was the, the only bass I used on kick and much of X um, I, and some of Listen like these because I bought that in '85 in, in Chicago. So the basic sound of these these beauties is is that bass so and the feel of it, the neck dimension. To recreate and, that, recreate right. Old Faithful as far as feel, basic sound. But then, you know, playing with the controls, you can get you know four other different distinct vintage bass sounds, including you know single core pick pickup sounds, right? Full humbucker sounds, reverse reverse P bass sounds. Um, Kind of all technical stuff, but you know, and no batteries, so it's all just simple, um, and in one pickup. So no one's ever done it before. So I actually um, applied for the patent and just, and I did drawing at school. So I did all my own drawings for the the application and got the patent. These are custom custom bodies that I've, I've been designing and, and building. Um, these are the prototypes, but now I'm going into production. So, so you built these? Yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. They well, first of all. They look gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, congratulations. So when they go into production, I mean, if somebody wants to buy one of these in the future, once they're in production, how are they going to be able to do that? Will well, there be a website for the guitar? Yes, uh, we're building the website at the moment. It'll be r up and running. Um, there'll be a basic page starting next week, under construction kind of one. And, and it's if you want to uh, find out about it, go to um, ggbbases.com. So Gary Gary Beers, basses at ggbbasses.com. Well, they're beautiful guitars. It's been great to hang out with you for a minute, and I'm a fan of the band. Thank you, Nick. And uh, I think I'm a fan of these guitars as well. Great talking to you, Gary Beers, for, for joining us on the stories behind the sessions. Thank you, Nick. Cheers, Thank you for having me. Thank you, Nick.